In this lesson, you're going to learn about a type of parallel processing called pipelining. Pipelining makes a program run more efficiently by overlapping the fetch, decode and execution stages of multiple instructions. A central processing unit designed specifically to do this is said to have a pipeline architecture. You can imagine pipelining is a bit like going to a fast food drive through You place your order at the first window, then move on to the next window to pay. As you're paying, someone behind you is placing their order. And when you collect your food, the person behind you is now paying and someone else is placing an order. The great thing about this system is that everyone gets their food more quickly and all of the staff are kept busy all of the time. And time, as they say, is money. To help us understand how this works in a computer, we're going to visualise the execution of a simple programme. When you learned about the von Neumann architecture, you were introduced to assembly code, an intermediate form of low-level code that's generated by a compiler while translating a high-level programme into machine code. Since there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between assembly code instructions and machine code instructions, it's convenient for us to imagine the CPU running assembly code rather than machine code. By the way, some programmers write assembly code themselves without relying on a compiler. It's a tricky skill to master, but it does allow for much more control over what's going on in the hardware. Each of the instructions you can see here has two parts. The first part is a command like load, add or store. It's the operation being performed and it's therefore known as the operation code. The second part of the instruction is the thing that the command is operating on. This is known as the operand. Once it's been fetched from memory and decoded, this particular instruction tells the CPU to go and get a copy of whatever's in memory location 471 and load it into the accumulator. Exactly what gets loaded into the accumulator depends on what's in that memory location. When the operand of an instruction is a memory address like this, the instruction is said to be using direct addressing. But suppose you wanted an instruction that would put the number 471 into the accumulator without having to go to the memory again. You need some way of telling the CPU that the operand is the value that it should work with and that it is not a memory address. A common approach in assembly languages is to use a special symbol in front of the operand, rather like this. With the hash symbol, the CPU knows that 471 is the actual value that it should work with and that it should load this value into the accumulator. Without the hash symbol, another trip to the memory would be needed to complete the instruction. When the operand of an instruction is the actual value to work with, the instruction is said to be using immediate addressing. Now let's think about how the computer might go about running this program, using von Neumann's original fetch decode execute cycle without pipelining. Notice that all of these instructions are using immediate addressing. To fetch an instruction, its memory address is copied from the program counter into the memory address register and then onto the address bus. At the same time, a read signal is sent to the memory controller via the control bus. The instruction is then copied into the memory data register via the data bus and then into the current instruction register. This all happens in one clock cycle. The instruction is decoded, which takes another clock cycle, and then it's executed, which takes yet another. The fetch decode execute cycle is repeated over and over again, the CPU dealing completely with each instruction, one at a time. The advantages of this approach come down to its simplicity. The control unit in particular can have an uncomplicated design with fewer components. This makes it cheap to manufacture and it doesn't need a lot of power while it's working. On the other hand, each part of the CPU is doing nothing at all much of the time. For example, while an instruction is being fetched, the decoding circuitry and the arithmetic and logic unit are standing idle.
While an instruction is being decoded or executed, the address bus and the data bus are both empty. Ideally, the whole CPU should be busy all of the time. Just like the staff in a fast food restaurant. So how can pipelining help? With a relatively small change to the workings of the control unit, this processor could be adapted to run this program more efficiently. The first instruction is fetched. But while it's being decoded, the second instruction is already on its way. And while the first instruction is being executed, the second instruction can be decoded and the third fetched all at the same time. We now have a system in which every part of the CPU is fully occupied while the program is running. An instruction is fetched, another decoded and another executed all in one clock cycle. Let's take a look at what's going on with a chart. We have time on the horizontal axis shown here in clock cycles. And here's our program. The chart tells us that once the program is well underway, something is being fetched, decoded and executed in every clock cycle. This group of instructions will therefore take 11 clock cycles rather than 27. With pipelining, potentially a program can finish in about a third of the time that it would otherwise take with the traditional von Neumann approach. But of course, this program makes extensive use of immediate addressing. Each instruction requires only one fetch from memory. If an instruction was using direct addressing instead, there would have to be another data fetch before it could finish its job, which would tie up the registers and the buses needed to fetch the next instruction the next instruction would simply have to wait. With lots of direct addressing going on, a smooth running pipeline would be impossible. Unless, that is, we were to redesign the CPU. For a start, we could have a data bus just for data and a separate instruction bus just for instructions. This would allow instructions and data to be fetched at the same time. We could even have separate memories for instructions and data. This is the fundamental principle behind the Harvard architecture. We could build a CPU with many more registers and create an assembly language that allows a single instruction to have more than one operand. A CPU could then get all of the data it needs from memory in one go with a pipelined sequence of load instructions. This would help to overcome hazards, like when an instruction can't finish because it's waiting for the results of a previous instruction that's still in the pipeline. We could also make better use of the CPU cache to handle problems caused by jump instructions that change the running order of the program. In fact, all of these design concepts and others have been developed over time and are now standard features in most modern computers.